and welcome to chapel. So I'm going to start with the verse, but before that, I want to say, if for those who don't know me, I'm Mrs. D, Mrs. Delaney. It's so good to see you. I'm going to start with this verse. It's from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. So let's do it, full of belief, confident that we're presentable inside and out. Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging, love, and helping out. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. What is that verse about, Miss D? It's about gathering, it's about being in community. And so chapel is designed for that. Once a week at school, you get to gather, you get to grow, you get to glorify God, and then you get to go tell someone about Jesus. And not just verbal lip service, but we want to encourage you to be a light, to walk it out, right? And so today, chapel is going to be off the chain. You will stay awake. You will not fall asleep. Somebody say amen. We are so excited for you today. Allow God's presence to, to reign over you, to wash over you. If you're carrying anything that may have been discouraging through last week, even up to today, I just want to pray over you that you would allow God to speak to you today and that God would fill any void, any broken place that may be hindering you today. So let me open up with prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here. God, will you sit down at every seat and minister to every heart in chapel today? Will you mend broken hearts? Will you deliver and set free captives today? Will you use your word to minister to us in the deep places of our spirit and in our hearts? Open up our minds to to Feel your presence. Open our eyes to see what you have for us today. Give us an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. Help us to be encouraged and leave different than the way we came into chapel. May it be a blessing to all who are here. In Jesus' name, amen. Then, um, in chapel, we also have this tradition uh, called uh, prayers for the world. Um, and... Um, um, it started, oh, I guess it started about five years ago now. Um, I got two introductory comments. If you're a freshman, um, uh, you know, you're wondering what prayers for the world is. Um, we wanted something in chapel that tried to get us a little bit outside of ourselves. I always think, um, uh, you, you, you go to a, I once saw a movie, it was a three-hour movie on a monastery set in the Alps. And it, the movie was called Integrate Silence because this monastery, the monks take an oath of silence. Other than singing a couple of times a day, they do not speak except for one day a year. And it's a three-hour movie, and it's silent. And um, on that one day a year, they were talking to the one of the monks, and here he is up in the Alps, alone and silent. And um, when they finally talked to him about what he does here, he said, you might think that I'm here trying to get into myself and understand, you know, the internal spiritual heart of who I, he goes, I really spend most of my time concerned and praying for the outside world. And my job here is to, in a way, seek the betterment of there through prayer and through concern. And I thought, what an amazing thing and also what a natural thing for for Christians to do. One complaint that Mr. Vanderwerf once heard of prayers for the world, we, we get a complaints about, or con constructive criticism about chapel every so often. Um, uh, one, one constructively critical remark said, you know, we really don't care about the world that much. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I thought this person must have been A, very honest, uh, fair enough, and B, I think we develop caring by uh, starting to, to do something. Um, going to Guatemala uh, makes you see the world in a new way, as Ezra just said. Um, praying 
makes you see the world anew. This is maybe a weird story, but when I was little and I went on trips, I used to uh, pick one person that I saw while I was driving on the trip, and I would think of that one person for the rest of that trip and wonder what they were doing. And I remember I, I was five or six. This is odd, but I was five or six, and I told my mom this, and she kind of looked scared. But then I, I, I said, we're going to pick this guy, and he was at an ice cream stand just leaning down, and he, looked, he just looked like a regular guy. And I said, every morning on that trip, I said, Mom, do you wonder what this guy is doing? And she, she I, I, anyway, uh, she never got that. But um, I, I'll always remember that guy. And, and then, uh, you know, from five to six to seven, occasionally once a year, I would think, what's that guy doing? And then it turned into... Um, this is a little personal, and I've not told people this, but it also turned into praying for this guy. Um, and I wonder, you start to get concerned for something other than yourself, and I think that's just one of the most natural Christian acts. The Lord's Prayer starts with the phrase, or early in the Lord's Prayer, it says, you know, um, your kingdom come, God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think part of prayer is, is to, to get a, a, a look at the outside world. Now, one last thing. The outside world can be quite complicated. And um, uh, I do think here, too, uh, Christians seek to act. And, and so I want to use a, a former student as an example for this. Um, for Prayers for the World today, we're thinking about uh, the refugees. Uh, uh, and, and we think of refugees moving into Europe right now. Mostly we think of them coming from Syria. But really, uh, a larger portion of them are moving uh, to, to Libya, which is on the, um, which is on the northern coast uh, of, of Africa. And they move across the Mediterranean, and there you can see the kind of boot of Italy. Uh, and Italy owns some islands. And, and they try to leave uh, um, Libya on these very makeshift boats, which is the next slide. And um, uh, guys try to charge them exorbitant amounts of money to put them on these boats. And then they try to make it to these European islands, hoping to get a new life. Now, um, there's a, a, a Doctors Without Borders. Some of these guys fall into water. Uh, uh, many of them suffer. Uh, a few years ago, 500 died in a single boating accident. Um, so Doctors Without Borders got the ship from the last um, uh, thing, and uh, they are out there trying to help people. And one of the Doctors Without Borders is a doctor in Los Angeles who graduated from this institution, and his name is David Beversloos. What I find interesting about David is he is fully aware that he is helping what we would call illegal immigrants break the law and illegally enter another country. He is also aware that it is a job of good-thinking people all over the world to seek to help others. And those two ideas are clashing on these poor um, refugees. His job, as far as he can see it, is not to take a strong stand on either side, but to talk to both sides. And then his main job is to give up about half his income to go and sit on an old boat and help treat people who are pulled out of the water. And I think he's a wonderful example of a prayer in action and I would like to pray for him and those refugees today in prayers for the world, if you could join me. Our Heavenly Father, this, this kingdom of yours is not fully come, and the world is broken, and people are on the move, and they are scared and looking for a better life. Heavenly Father, please help us find ways to... Um, Bring healing to the countries where these people flee so that they may not flee any longer. Please help us find ways to show your love and compassion to all who need it in the world. And please help us find good, just systems that seek to solve the problems that humanity is facing. We thank you for these people that are fleeing the countries. Um, they are your people. They are ways in which we can show your love in this world. And we thank you for the life of David Beversluis and many others who are seeking to be an extension of that love.
this we bring to you uh, in, in the name of your son. Amen. Uh, as David is passing the peace of Christ physically, could you rise and pass the peace of Christ to each other? Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Mr. Vanderwerf, and I'm one of the Bible and theology teachers here, uh, and also help organize and lead uh, the chapels throughout the year. Um, this year, uh, our theme verse is 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And last week, Mr. Maccabee uh, talked about it a bit, and I want to look at it, and I want to give it some, a bit more context uh, that will hopefully shape our time together throughout the year. So it says this, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So I want to imagine for a moment what Timothy, who received this letter from Paul, must have been feeling like. So I want to imagine a bit of the context of what was going on when Timothy, young Timothy, first received this letter. Um, I can imagine that Timothy felt a bit overwhelmed getting this letter because essentially what this letter is, is Paul handing the baton of his ministry off to Timothy. And so the Apostle Paul we're a bit more familiar with. Uh, he wrote much of the New Testament. And at this point, he's an old man. And he's nearing the end of his career. In fact, he's likely nearing the end of his life. And he's giving final instructions to Timothy to take over what Paul has been doing. This great missionary of the Christian faith, the one who's writing these letters, the one who's planting churches all around the Mediterranean world. And now he's saying, Timothy, pick up where I left off. But I can imagine Timothy receiving this, a little, this letter and being completely overwhelmed. And he could come with this whole list of excuses. Timothy might say, I can't do this. Paul, look, you've been trained in the greatest religious schools by the greatest religious teachers of the day. Paul had been, uh, been schooled to be essentially a, a Jewish rabbi. To put it in modern day context, uh, Paul would likely be getting his PhD in theology, heading for a career either as a pastor, or perhaps as a theology professor at Calvin College or Calvin Seminary. He is going to be uh, a great religious leader. But Timothy, all that we know about Timothy is that he learned the faith from his mom and his grandma. Uh, he was homeschooled in the Christian faith. He didn't go to the great religious schools. He didn't have the great religious teachers. I can imagine Timothy getting this letter from Paul and saying, Paul, you can do all these things because you've got the degrees. You've got the pedigree. You've got the credentials. I've only got my mom's teaching, and my grandma's teaching. That's all I've got. I'm not qualified to pick up where you left off. So I can imagine Timothy feeling ill-equipped to do the work that Paul is calling him to do. But then I can imagine Timothy getting this letter and then looking around at the city in which Timothy was living. I lived in the city of Ephesus, and we've got a few pictures of the ruins of Ephesus here. Uh, Ephesus was one of the greatest cities in the ancient world, uh, fourth largest city at this time. Here's a picture of uh, the remains of the library. It was built a little bit after uh, Timothy was here. But this, this picture of the library gets a sense of how Ephesus was an intellectual center. Uh, great thinkers came to Ephesus. This was a place of great learning. And here, poor, homeschooled Timothy taught by his mom and his grandma, was somehow supposed to influence and impact this great intellectual center of Ephesus. Uh, the next picture. Uh, is this a close-up of the library? Let's go to the next, next one here. Uh, these are the ruins of a great temple, the temple to the goddess Artemis. Uh, one of the great, it was essentially the religious center of this worship uh, of Artemis. Uh, people would come from all over the place to worship, to offer sacrifices. This was an enormous temple, larger than the temples in Athens. This theater, 
um, could hold about 25,000 people. Um, and on the right side of the picture, where you see kind of these pillars, there actually, imagine a wall walling this entire place off yet. I think the last concert, by the way, that um, was, was held here was Bon Jovi. Um, and uh, they estimated that that concert alone did more damage to this theater than the last 2,000 years of weathering um, um, the rain and the storms and whatnot. But Ephesus was this intellectual center. It was this religious center for the worship of, of Artemis. It was a center of the arts and culture. And here Timothy was told, go leave your mark. Set an example here. Uh, one more picture. This is the, the walkway of the marketplace. And you imagine, you'll need to use your imagination that it would be lined with, with shops. And at the end of the street was a harbor. The Mediterranean Sea came up right to the end of that street. Ships would drop off cargo, and, and there would be a, 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 a port leading the, the goods off to the rest of the Mediterranean world. So imagine young Timothy, ill-equipped in his mind, standing in this great metropolis city of Ephesus, an intellectual center, a center for the arts, center for the economy, center of this religion, and Timothy thinking, what, what can I do? Uh, I'm not equipped to do this. And then Paul says this, no, don't let anyone look down upon you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul didn't tell Paul didn't tell Timothy to set an example or leave your mark by overturning uh, economic systems or political structures or to go into the temple and tear down the idols, but he told him to do seemingly insignificant things. Watch your words. Watch how you talk. What you say. Uh, watch your conduct. Watch your life. How are you loving one another? How's your faith? And then this bizarre one, how's your purity? Purity, has a, is, purity is a dirty word, I feel like, now. Um, being pure somehow is being dirty. Uh, but seemingly insignificant things. And somehow, through those five insignificant things, Paul was telling Timothy, you're going to have a great influence on this huge city of Ephesus. Somehow it must have worked because Ephesus became a major center of Christianity for centuries. So whatever Timothy did must have worked. And so our, our theme for the year, based on this verse, is leave your mark. And we'll, we're going to explore this more in the coming uh, weeks and months uh, ahead. But I, here's what I love about it. Uh, it's inspired by this passage, set an example, could also be translated as leave your mark. And I love this image of a fingerprint for a couple reasons. Each of us has a unique fingerprint. Not one is like another. You and I are each uniquely created by God, blessed by God, gifted by God to leave a unique mark on this world. You have, you have gifts, you have skills, you have abilities that I don't have that no one else has. And God is calling you to leave your unique mark. And some of us might feel, like Timothy, a bit ill-equipped, a bit overwhelmed by the magnitude of the task. But God is saying, leave your mark. Leave your unique mark. I created you in a unique, uh, special way with unique abilities and gifts to leave your unique mark on the world and the people around you. So a fingerprint gets at this uniqueness, and we'll explore that, how we are uniquely designed by God. But the second thing I like about the fingerprint image is that it's pretty insignificant. Uh, you can't really see them. Uh, if someone were to come up here and look, you won't be able to see my fingerprints on the podium. But they're here. And so it's often in the small things. It's the insignificant things that we often don't get credit for through our words, through our life, through our love, through our faith, and purity, that we actually are leaving a mark on this world. So my encouragement over the coming weeks, coming months, reflect on this. Leave your mark. 
how are you uniquely made by God, gifted by God, to leave a mark? Again, we'll come back to it over the coming weeks and months ahead, but please pray with me. God, thank you for uniquely equipping each of us with certain gifts and abilities that no one else has. You have wired each of us in unique, special ways to leave our distinct mark on the world. Help us to be confident that even in small things, the way that we use our words, the way that we live, the way that we love one another, the way we deepen and grow in our faith and lead lives of purity, even those insignificant things, we are leaving our mark, and in by doing so, we are leaving your mark on the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.